Hey, it's Stuart McKelvey, and you're listening to Why to How, a podcast where we explore adventures in STEM. On today's episode, I'm joined by David Ross, the incredibly personable CEO of Ross Video, powering video productions for billions of global viewers daily. If you've ever watched a news broadcast, the Super Bowl, the Grammys, Tony Awards, eSport or Drone Championships, or watched a worship ceremony, it's likely you've witnessed the power of Ross Video and their product and software solutions. David was a Candlewide Science Fair finalist in 1978, 79 and 81. He was awarded the honour of being Ottawa's CEO of the year in 2016 and has been awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Ottawa for his achievements in engineering and business. Ross Video is a silver sponsor of the Ottawa Regional Science Fair and David still holds his three Canada-wide Science Fair medals among his greatest achievements. I'm super excited for this podcast episode and I'm sure you're going to absolutely love this conversation. So David, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join me on the Why to How podcast. Thanks, I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely, yeah, I'm very excited for this conversation. I mean, uh, spending a couple of hours looking into your life. Uh, it's a fascinating life, absolutely. And uh, you are very much uh, on, <laughs> on personable on your social media accounts. So I'm imagining this conversation is going to be somewhat similar. No, in, in real no. life, <laughs> I'm not personable at all. <laughs> Just <dead> man, <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> So, David, with these, we uh, we always start right back in your childhood. We like to say it's like a therapy session, <laughs> cracking open the memories. Um, and in an interview that you did with Feed Magazine a couple of years ago, they actually asked you what drives you to innovate, and you responded with, I don't like to be bored. And I figure that's a great place to start, and I imagine as a kid that was still a big part of who you were. Yeah, I, I, th- I think it was. I, I remember uh, being told, this is in university, but I think it still applied, like, uh, my roommates would say, Dave, you're always doing something. Why don't you just sit on the couch with us and hang out and watch TV and drink a beer? And I said, well, I, no, there's too many things for me to do, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think uh, even even when I was, uh, you know, a teenager and, and earlier, I was always building something or doing things like that. I, I remember actually once uh, uh, thinking it would be a cool idea to build a sail out of some plastic uh, and, and some, some, some wood. And I uh, and I would be seen like zooming down on a skateboard on our, on our front street, you know, <laughs> going incredibly fast, you know, as as this 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 sail was pulling me. And I, it's like I was always doing crazy projects. It was fun. I, mean, I just imagine all the neighbors yelling out, it's like, "What are you doing?" And you're just responding, "It's science." And she just goes zooming past her front <laughs> gate. Uh, and then at age nine, you were already assigned to program computers, and I bet most of our listeners wouldn't even imagine what programming in 1975 could even look like. Uh, so what, what was it that drew you to programming in particular, especially well back before you know, the early days of computers and graphic interfaces like we see now? Oh, yeah. I mean, I started probably six years before the IBM PC even came out. Mm-hmm. You know, the first thing my dad showed me on a computer was... Uh, it had front panel switches. This is how old it was. And he put it on the kitchen table. It was an IMSI 8080 for anybody who knows stuff like that. And he set up an address and click deposit and then come back and show me it was still there. Like the bite that was, you know, it's like, wow, the bite is still there. (laughs) So neat. (laughs) I mean, expectations were low back then. Um, and, and, uh, we, we had paper tape and things like that, uh, starting out, but it was really games. Um, Mm -hmm. Like even in the earliest days, you know, you'd have little uh, text-oriented things like Lunar Lander or uh, or little little games where you'd answer questions and it would seem like it was intelligent the way it worked it out. And it was just in basic or sometimes it was in assembly code. Uh, but after a while, I, I got tired of playing the games and I realized that I had the source code for these games because like even Microsoft Basic, they would Microsoft in the day would send you the source yeah. code. You could actually modify basic if you wanted to. So I would go in there and I'd modify the game and change the rules, you know, and, and you'd be like, wow, look at that. You know, you get four aliens instead of two or something like that that are trying to kill you. And and uh, that 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 would really blew my mind that you could change the rules of something. Mm-hmm. And and that led me to eventually writing my own games and applications and things like that. It was, it was but it started with games. So it was games, yeah. And I imagine changing the rules will get onto the way you approach business being a bit different to everyone else i imagine you know that could all stem if i was an actual therapist could all stem from you changing the rules in the games you were playing as a kid 
That's right. The other is interesting. In business, there are no rules, only laws. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and some people say it's, business is an infinite game. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. And so I guess then it's a, a good segue to your, your dad starting, starting Ross Video. How did the work of your dad and then the early days of Ross Video sort of influence your interests? Oh, well, I mean, my... my Big uh, what's that? Big question. Big question. I mean, well, my, my father was an engineer. His father was an engineer. Uh, his father was a gardener, uh, so he doesn't count. Uh, yeah. But uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm a third generation engineer. So, so, you know, dinner table conversations and things like that would be technical. My father's interests would be technical. I mean, we're, my, my dad also was good at surveying and things like that. And we built a runway in the park in front of our house, uh, you know, uh, and, and learned all about things like that. So, uh, but going into the company, um, it was neat. I mean, there was circuit boards, there was video, there was manufacturing, there was uh, uh, so much tech. You, you walk in and you just think it was this wonderland of complicated stuff that's mysterious, but obviously did really cool things. And, and as a kid, you know, you, you gravitated to, to things like that. Like, at least I was. Yeah, I, mean, I, I imagine it would have been like an engineering kid's, you know, heaven, you know, like dream come true where you just walk in and it's like there's just inventions everywhere on the table and you're not quite sure what it all does, but you know it seems cool and, you know, your dad's passionate about it. So that just obviously drives your influence, drives your interest, yeah. I mean. Um, when you look back on your childhood then, like what is it that sticks out as being particularly something that was unique to you that has, you know, made you who you are today, perhaps other people don't, don't see or? Well, I, I guess uh, I, I grew up in a small town uh, for mm -hmm. one thing, and uh, it was uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a mill town farming community. And so uh, the, in, in public school and high school were a little harder in some ways than maybe they would have been in the city. Uh, and, and so, yeah. It, it gave me a place to go to do the things that were challenging and stimulating because because there's a lot of times that uh, that that wasn't the case in school. Let's put it mm -hmm. that way and, and, and things like that. So so uh, you could sort of say like I remember actually um, I um, I think my father used to say, I, I don't know what's going to become of that boy, you know, and, and things like that before I got into technology. You know, I think I mostly just got myself into trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so it was maybe technology is uh, is is a, a conduit for for a lot of energy and, and focus for a kid that you know needs an anchor. You know, uh, to to uh, you know, if, if I didn't have technology, I'd probably be in jail now or something. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how you, like you just find that one interest that just changes everything about the way you approach life, right? Do you remember what your mindset was like in those early days when you were you know running around playing? With computers and then eventually starting to create science fair projects yeah um i i remember uh one of the things about doing that is before the science fair projects i would do a bunch i just sort of hack around in the games and things like that mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd write little projects so you know most things would last maybe a, a few days and then you'd be done uh and you wouldn't set your your, your goals very very high uh and I actually got into science fairs because uh, a teacher called me out of class and pulled me into the hallway one day in grade five, I think it was, and said, you know, I've heard you're, you're, you're competing in a science fair and you're too young. You, you have to wait another year or two or something like that. And, and we just want you to know that we're there for you when you're actually allowed to compete. And I went, what's a science fair? Like, <laughs> They, they must have confused the stuff I was doing at home with computers with the science fair project. And all of a sudden I, I, I went, wow, you mean I can do something and like win a competition or maybe make money or go on a trip. You know, <laughs> this is so cool. I, I was just doing this for me. So, uh, you know, I, I, I figured, well, you know, when I was allowed to do it, uh, I, I chose a project that took a year. And so instead of doing something that takes three days, I did something that took like 300 days and, and chose a project that was that complicated. And uh, it totally changed the way you, 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 you make a project, I guess, and, and how you break something down into smaller parts and how it all starts to come together to the final project. And uh, that was really new to me. 
you know, uh, new to any kid, right? Most kids do things that last a few days, you know, not not a year. So I think that was a a, a big change for me anyway. And, and also I was competitive. So uh, I, I went in there even to the first one saying, hmm, I want to win. And my first project, you know, I, I won uh, silver in Canada. So it worked out okay. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, can you, do you want to tell the audience what your first couple of science fair projects were? Like, what were you actually working on back, back in sure. the day? Um, the first one was uh, a, a very basic video game. I, I, it was called Gunner. Uh, and, and today, I mean, with augmented reality and VR glasses and everything else, I mean, this is nothing. It was as simple as... Having a video screen where you shoot a bullet at a target and you had to game, guess what the inclination was, and and you'd have a couple of shots. You know, you'd say fifty nine degrees, fifty nine point five degrees, or whatever else, and the, the the bullet would go up and explode if it hits a thing, and it come down, and go boom on the ground, and it would give you a score. There's nothing more complicated than that. That won silver for Canada. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I mean. In the process, I mean, I, I actually, actually built the computer uh, that, that did that uh, from a kit, uh, and I, um, I had to do assembly code programming and basic programming and, and make that work, learning how to do video. So there was actually a lot to the project when you tore it down, because it also had to work in real time. And I mean, this is like 1978. Nothing was real time back in 78. So um, uh, that was fun. Um, and the next one, uh, was a project where my father, uh, looked at what I was trying to do, went, choose a different project. This is too hard. Uh, which made me say, well, I'm definitely going to do this one now. Uh, and, <laughs> and so, uh, the project was about artificial intelligence, uh, from the point of view of, you know, a kid in 1980. Uh, and I developed a program that would generate an infinite, nearly infinite number of different types of mazes. And so it would design a maze with one way in and one way out. Uh, and uh, and then it would have another program that would then try to solve the maze. So the first mm -hmm. program would generate, the second program would solve it, and then we'd show how it did it. And that one gold, uh, actually. Uh, it was a project called Cybernetics, and that was uh, quite a challenge as well. Uh, and then um, the third one was the one I was most proud of, actually. Um, it was real-time three-dimensional stereoscopic graphics. And I think I did that in like grade nine or grade 10. And so uh, it, 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 it used a lot of the technology that you see in the theaters today, where you have Polaroid glasses. I didn't go red green, I went Polaroid, uh, polarized. Mm -hmm. And two, two monitors and a semi-silvered mirror. And then I'd you know, overlay the images. Then I'd give, give glasses. I made like 50 pairs of glasses up uh, and, and I had a, a control box. In some ways, it was almost like flying a uh, you know model airplane or something like that with joysticks and knobs and things like that. And it would start with with an image on the screen that was completely two D and flat. And then I'd build it out so that it it became three dimensional. And I had I actually digitized the space shuttle as lines out of National Geographic. And I'd flow it fly it out to your nose and back in again and then spin it around in real time. Uh, and the processor, I mean, you get your computer today is like a, you know, a six or eight core, it's three gigahertz. This was a two, two megahertz processor, single core, eight bit. So doing this in real time was a hell of a challenge. And uh, I use math that I had to go to the math teacher two years ahead saying, what's a matrix multiply? How's this all work? You know, I got to rotate points in three dimensional space. Can you help me? <laughs> Uh, and it was it was really neat. I remember um, being at the science fair and meeting some guy at Electro Home at the time, and he went, "You're two years ahead of our department's research. You're where we wanted to be in two years. Like, who are you? And we want to offer you a job someday when you graduate high school mm -hmm. and university." Uh, and it turned out that that guy became the CTO of RealD, which of course is what's on all the glasses uh, to this mm -hmm. day. So it was. I mean, those are three projects, and it's a long answer, but uh, it was quite the uh, quite the arc of, of projects. Absolutely, and I mean, like the obvious question then is like, how did you go about learning everything you needed for these science fair projects? If you're that far ahead, especially you know with that third project of yours, where where did you even start from? What foundation did you start with, and then how did you like get that extra knowledge you needed? Wow, um, I'd seen some. My, my, it, it's just, it came from tons of different sources. I mean, mm -hmm. the first project taught me real time. 
programming and in 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 and, uh, and how to do it in assembly code. The second project taught me how to do graphics, you know, with pixels instead of characters and things like that, uh, and and how to build control panels and single board computers and and get more hands on. Uh, the third project, um, we we bought a project uh, a program from a company called Sublogic uh, that did it, and so I learned how to how to do that with somebody else's software, but it was too slow, too cumbersome. And so I actually rewrote it from the ground up to be faster. But this is a professional program. Imagine like sitting there going, you know, the Epic Games Unreal Engine isn't good enough, so I'm gonna write my own. Uh, <laughs> but in a way, <laughs> that's kind of what I, yeah, what I did back like in the did. day. But, it, but each part project, you know, built on the previous one and there was, there was sources of inspiration all over the place. And it just, I just, Put a lot of time into it and so was there like a mentor or someone that you went to for advice not even necessarily technical advice but was there someone that was like a main pillar of support for you that you were able to to go to when you needed it mostly my father i think mm -hmm. um i mean he was an engineer obviously uh, and he could answer some questions but my dad is building the company and I would tell him, you know, you know, once a month what I was up to sort of thing or, to, or talk to him about being stuck. But mostly he was like, mm, go figure it out. I got a company to run. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 looking back, I have no idea how I did it. <laughs> I know. I know. That's that, what I'm uh, feeling right now. <laughs> yeah. I don't I know, know how you did it. All the, all the kids at school are like, your dad did that. You didn't do that. And I was like, you look how many hours this is. This is like every day after school until late at night, sometimes, you know, having to be dragged up for supper and things like that. Uh, my dad doesn't have time to build this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just the perfect example of just like finding that thing that you're so passionate about that just drives, you know, like it just drives you every, takes up every spare minute of yourself, you know, like how often does that happen in life where, except for science fair, for example, where you know, you just like get this project in your head and you just dive straight in head first. And especially as a kid, you just don't know that you shouldn't be doing it, right? You're like, yeah. well, why can't I just rewrite this program that a professional company probably paid millions of dollars, you know, and a whole team of people like, why can't I just make it better? Um, I think that's definitely, you know, the, the power of youth and the power of passion, that's for sure. Yeah, you sometimes you have no idea what you're getting yourself into, so you just do it anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's... yeah that's it. So. So then what were some of the key lessons do you think that you learned from these science fair projects? And then how has that obviously carried through to your work that you do as a CEO at Ross Video? Oh, I, well, well that, that gets into uh, this, the speech that I gave at uh, the Regional Science Fair a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually one of the first times that I sort of reconnected with my science fair past. And uh, I thought I'd, I'd do something. Uh, how, do you, how do you bridge being a CEO on one side to your, you know, kids that are, you know, they're doing science fair projects uh, and, and, and make it relate. And uh, I suddenly realized that how much I learn literally from, uh, from these projects. So I, I went through and I said, everything I needed to know to become a CEO, I learned making science fair projects. So in a tech company, for example, you've got research and development. Well, that's the actual work, mm -hmm. but the project, uh, you, I did, you know, I had to be broken down to many different things and I had to have it done by a deadline. Well, that's project management, which is also in your company and you have to understand that. And then uh, I, I had to figure out how was I going to pay for these monitors or, you know, the, the things I need, the, 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 the glasses, you know, 50 pairs of glasses, you know, and even if it's convincing your parents to pay for it or something like that or doing some side jobs, uh, that's, um, that's, uh, financial planning and, 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 uh, and, uh, you know, managing your finances. But then when you're doing your booth, it's all about marketing. You know, what are you going to put up on the walls? What are you going to do to drag people in to get them excited? And, and, and the judges, you want the judges to see that other people are excited about this as well. And that you're excited and you understand it. Well, that's marketing. And, uh, and then when the judge arrives, I, I sometimes, you know, I would see other kids and they'd say, well, you know, why did the plant grow when you put coffee on it or something like that? And they like, I don't know. Or they look at their foot, their feet or, you know, it's like, no, you, you, you've, you've got to, you got to say it with the passion. You got to, you got to get people excited about what you're doing. Judges are human beings. You know? And so that sales. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then, you know, you, you just take all of these different things together uh, and building your project is manufacturing. 
And so it's the kernel of all the things you need to build a tech company are actually in that science fair project. And so uh, I, I really do think it had a lot to do with the things that came later in life. I mean, um, I used to do um, demonstrations of our products at trade shows and things like that. That's eerily familiar. That's the same thing as selling your project to people walking by, you know, at, at a science fair and to judges who are, you know, and the judges in this case are the buying decision makers and the, the people wandering by are influencers. You know, it's, uh, it's very, very similar. And you just keep going down the list of all the things I just said. And you can just feel all the different ways that um, it affected my life. Yeah, I mean, that's it's a perfect summary. Yeah, you had like a tweet that perfectly like broke it down into each of the different key points. And when I saw that, I was like, yes, like this is exactly why science fair is so important because I think for a lot of people, they, they hear science fair and they're, they're not part of the, the community of science fair. They hear it and they're like, well, it's like it's just about you doing a science fair project. You know, like they think it's only the technical side of what you're learning doing the research project, but it's not, it's everything else. Like it's all the, the personality building, the communication skills in particular, you know, networking as well, all of these things combined together just to show you that like, oh, you're not alone in your passion for science. Mm -hmm. That's amazing to start with. But then it's also, what are you learning? And that's literally changes the rest of your life. I mean, I did something similar back in Australia. It's not quite a science fair project. It's a science forum. Um, but that, that is the key turning point in my life. Like I, I went from being, you know, like a shy introverted kid to then becoming a person that can now interview, you know, CEOs across, across Canada on a podcast. So, um, science fair truly does change people's lives. That's for sure. And now let's move to your present day then. Like let's, let's talk more about the work you do. Do you want to, I've already given a brief description of what Ross video is, but maybe do you want to provide a bit more context about what it is that you actually do as CEO of Ross video? Oh. Uh, well, I guess first you have to understand what Ross Video is. Yeah. Uh, so we're uh, just closing in on a thousand employees now. My father started the company. Obviously, we talked about that back in 1974 in the basement of our house, which is another thing to prove that you can do it from almost from scratch. He yeah. sold an airplane for uh, $3,400, and that was the financial seed capital of the company. Uh, so it's it's almost like one of these stories. Like people go, like, that is just so poetic. It, it, mm -hmm. it's, you made that up, right? No, it's actually true. Um, and if you watch, um, watch, t uh, television, uh, the news, entertainment shows, if you go to a stadium, you see something on a, a production on a big screen. If you, you go to a, a large worship ceremony uh, and you see there's a production there or, uh, or even watching your members of parliament, award shows, game shows, you, you have control rooms of equipment, you know, full of things that are ready camera one, go to camera two and put the fonts up in front of people and do all the special effects and manage the audio. That's what we do. We make the equipment that makes that happen. And uh, it's, uh, it didn't start that way. We just started with the ready camera one, you know, production switcher. Uh, but, um, but now we make almost every piece of equipment that you'll find in the, in the control room. And, uh, and outside of the control room as well, because we do sell cameras and we sell uh, camera motion systems, which I like to call robots. Uh, so it's, it's neat. I mean, we, from a technology point of view, uh, you know, we go from everything from robots to electronics, to control panels, to software, uh, to the cloud and, and GPU processing. And, and actually we work with Epic Unreal's gaming engine, which is really cool back to my roots of uh, manipulating 3d video it's like oh if i could only have done that you know yeah. <laughs> i could have put grass coming out and flowers on the top of the space shuttle in real time uh <laughs> now you're uh, mad at yourself yeah <laughs> back in 1980 yeah so so, so it, it's it's really cool in that we have a really neat industry where all of our customers are in the media or they're in the business of being famous and doing really cool things uh, and including like NASA and, and things like that are, are customers as well. Uh, but um, at the same time, we, we've got all these cool technologies and we have a factory that builds them. So that's really neat. We have three surface mount machines running full time, putting, I think every second that we're talking, we're putting about 50 components onto a circuit board in, in our factory. It, I, sometimes I think, wow, is that that's still going on? Yes, it has been, uh, it, you know, while I'm, on, on the you know on the call with you and then the other thing that's really cool is we have a production company now uh and it does about a thousand events for 
you know, ESPN and NBC and uh, you name it uh, for, for live events. And they have mobile productions and studios and things like that. Uh, and of course, it's all equipment that we designed that is built in our factory to make it happen. So it's, it's something that we call a vertically integrated company mm -hmm. that goes right from the idea to the resistor all the way to the finish, final um, television program. Must be so cool too. I mean, I'm a bit of a video production nerd as well, obviously, uh, which is what my you know my job is and why I see. But uh, like reading into your solutions, both hardware and software, and then the production company side of things, like it must be so satisfying to know that you sort of like have your finger in all of these these pies in a general interest that you have. You know, like business usually is so siloed. Science is usually so siloed. You know, you, you specialize in the one thing, right? But you're like, no, I, I want to do all of these amazing things and, and make it the best we possibly can. And it's that integration, I think, between the silos that that are uh, that make Ross Video so special. That's for sure. Yeah, I, th I think I think it's an interesting point. You're talking about the silos because a lot of technology companies are built on a truly special knowledge uh, of both a, a technology and a business need. And they put them together and you have a startup and that's what they do. So the company, you know, becomes just that the, the founder's knowledge and everybody, everything builds on that. I mean, if, if, uh, if all you're good at is electronics, then you're not going to do software. If you're doing software, you're, you're not going to be doing, you know, um, mechanical stuff with robots. And, and there is a certain moment in, in, as we was growing the company, where I suddenly had this, this thought, well, it's just people. It's just people that know what they're doing. If you can get people that know what they're doing in other areas, and sometimes you do that by buying a company and sometimes you do it by hiring people, then we can do adjacent things. And the combination is greater than the sum of the whole. And, and, and so the, um, uh, that was a freeing decision. And it's not easy for a technical uh, CEO to give that up, mm -hmm. to say, I'm going to have technology in my company that I'm not an, a profound expert in anymore. Uh, and it's, it's like a trust fall on yeah. other people. Uh, but if you, you have the right culture and, you, have, yeah, and you, you hire good people, it works spectacularly well. But I think it's rare. I think it is rare as well. And I mean, <laughs> this segues quite nicely into my next question, which is gonna be how important is it as a CEO to have that engineering background, that knowledge and understanding of some of the technical aspects of the industry, as opposed to you know, like a business leader, which doesn't have that technical you know, inherent knowledge, I guess. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I remember reading, a, there was a study that was done once on, it was either IBM or Intel, I think, where um, they would alternate someone between a financial CEO and an engineering CEO. And what they found, if I remember correctly, uh, I'll probably get misquoted, I'll be misquoting it somehow, but, uh, what they found, uh, and I might be biased on this as well, but the they got really good short-term short-term results with a financial CEO. He'd prune over here, he'd tweak something over here, and he'd say, "Why are we doing this? Let's get rid of this and make all the tough decisions." The engineering CEO and the technical CEO would would have better long-term results. They would have more of a vision for the future. Uh, they would they would inspire people to do their best and, and, and get excited about the customer needs and things like that more than just the stock price and, and, and efficiencies. And uh, so I, I think that it's really hard to give a financial person the knowledge of the technology and the customer need to create a vision that inspires people. It's easier to take somebody who has all that and back them up with somebody uh, who's financial. Uh, and and so financial is is sometimes it it, it uh, can be an enabler, but most of the time it's boundaries. Mm -hmm. It's like you can't spend more than like twenty three percent on R and D this year, you know. And it's like, but if we if we spend twenty five percent, we could do twice as much. Let me tell you why, you know. And but the, so the financial people are always trying to keep you in check, but sometimes too much. But they save your life a lot of the time as well. But uh, but I think. Um, for a tech company, there's, there's nothing like, I think, understanding the tech and being passionate about it to, to be successful. And I think especially for people that are maybe, you know, at that stage in their lives where they're not quite sure what to do, I think, you know, 
any sort of understanding of STEM, even if it is just like a basic um, science tech project, or if you go to university and just do it like a, uh, you know, quite a wide uh, science degree, that's always going to stand you in a good stead, in no matter what career you go to. I think having some sort of technical aspects, some sort of technical knowledge of just the way the world works, and I think just even the mindset of the scientific method is so important to the way you approach any decision in life that a science science is so important it doesn't matter what you go into well that's that, that's so true i mean uh being an engineer uh and and being based in science means that you really want to understand the problem and make a decision based on facts mm-hmm. sometimes you can make some great decisions based on uh on, on emotion uh but most of the time it's like flipping a coin yeah. gambling yeah. and and that's that's no way to run a company yeah. <laughs> so so uh I, yeah i i really like to uh to be able to when we need to to be able to do the deep dive and and not get lost in in uh in the complexity of the problems and and be able to think about how do we break this down into something that's manageable so we can go forward and, and you know what it's more fun anyway uh, it's it's hard to get passionate about financial goals, but it's it's uh, technological goals and customer based goals and things like that are a lot lot easier to to, to stay with for the long term. As an ex accountant, I can one hundred percent agree that it is much harder to get passionate about financial goals than it is technological uh, innovation. Right. So, speaking about the way you approach business, and uh, I mentioned earlier that it's quite it seems quite different to the way that a lot of other businesses, in my experience, approach their business. But I was reading an article about the way you hold your senior management meetings, where all participants are able to list as many issues as they think need discussing, and you use a spin the wheel method to select the next topic so that no one person you know dominates a com- conversation. And we've discussed in previous episodes of the podcast the importance of communication and effective communication. And so, despite all the efforts to the contrary, STEM shouldn't be thought of as just being within silos, as we mentioned earlier separate from one another. So I'm curious if the style of the meetings that you hold with your senior management team and where they expose issues with various different departments of Ross Video, does that help to bring about greater creativity and in the, in the problem solving process? Is that the secret to your success that everyone sort of aware of what is going in, going on in the wider, um, wider course of business across the whole, the whole company? I think so. Yeah. Uh, like, Every company has its silos, you know, uh, particularly uh, sales and marketing and R&D, you know, are always, you know, fighting with each other. How come this product is late? How come you sold it too soon? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how did you get the spec wrong? How come you didn't tell me what was needed? Uh, and things like that. Uh, and you need to be able to pull all those things together for, for a better understanding. And, and when you have a, you know, a crisis or a decision you need to make at the senior management level, uh, you know, everything touches on everything else. Uh, you know, the financial people need to know what's going on, the manufacturing people, the support people. And, and so when we have a senior team meeting, uh, it's, it is so useful to have uh, a diversity of opinions. Because uh, by the way, running, running the financial group is a different personality type often, or should be almost. Mm-hmm. than running manufacturing, than running R&D, than running sales and marketing. I mean, those are very different roles. So you get different people who look at problems in a different way. And, uh, and my role as a CEO in some ways is just make sure it stays cordial as we, as we uh, work through the problems. It's like, you know, sometimes maybe I, you know, it's the, the therapist on top of it all just saying, okay, let's cool this down. Yeah. Uh, we just want to solve the problem. And, uh, uh, but, but usually, you know, conflict comes from misunderstandings. So if, if everybody knows what the other person's problem is and you don't guess, uh, and, and often if you don't know what somebody else does in a company, usually for some reason, assume it's nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So-and-so over there, oh, they're useless. Say, I've never seen anything that they do that comes out. It's like, it turns out that that person's critically important. It just doesn't touch what you do, you yeah. know? And, but but you, you form these opinions and, and that can happen right all, all the way up to the senior staff. So, so having the senior staff work together uh, eliminates those things. You end up with uh, a balanced viewpoint coming out of it. And everybody leaves a meeting and, and the whole company gets the same marching orders with the same message. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's fantastic, actually. It eliminates so much conflict and waste. And I think it also sets a good tone for the, the culture of the rest of the company, too. If the senior management are aware of issues in different departments, if, if you're all 
having these long meetings every single week and you're getting to know one another on a personal level, that all filters down, even if it's not explicitly, it like implicitly filters down through the rest of the business. And I think then overall you have this, this greater awareness of, you know, that is the, the, the vision of the company, I guess, as a whole, uh, rather than every team just focusing on their little tiny piece and not worrying about what the person in the next building does. Yeah, it's amazing, actually. I noticed sometimes, like, we have a weekly meeting and we spend, like, five hours in it, which mm -hmm. I have other CEO friends time. going, what in the world? Can you guys find the time? To, like, five hours? You know, I have a half an hour meeting every week or every month or something like that. And I went, really? How do you run the company? How do you know? Yeah, how do you know? <laughs> how, do you, how do you do it? I don't know. You don't get it. And he says, that's normal. That's normal. I said, I, I don't care what normal is. I just care what works. And I, I don't understand how that works. Um, but uh, I find if we don't have a meeting for maybe three weeks, I see us start to pick at each other. Mm -hmm. And I see misunderstandings come up. And I see directions start to, to move out and, 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 and things move into cross purposes. It's fascinating, actually. And then one meeting you pull it all back together again. So I, I can I can only imagine the dysfunction that must exist in other companies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it does. <laughs> um, I think also the secret a little bit as well to your success is just you as a as a leader. I mean, you're, you're a very hands-on, approachable, personable CEO, that's for sure. Um, you encourage staff interactions with one another. You have fun with promotional videos. I, I have in mind the uh, like your your NAB promo video from a couple of years ago, and then you know trading the socks. Uh, you have you know managers breakfasts. You're very re very very responsive on social media. Probably the most responsive CEO, um, maybe not as famous as Elon Musk, but certainly the most responsive and knowledgeable CEO on uh, on social media. And you seem to have an amazing understanding of just so many different aspects of your business. And I mean, you'll even make time to jump on a a brand new STEM podcast with a random guy from across the country to talk about the, the importance of science fairs. So why do you see this approachable management style as being important and effective and crucial to the success of Ross video? Well, it's interesting. On, on one side, there's two, two sides to that answer. On one side, mm -hmm. people buy from people they like, uh, and, and you have to generate trust as well for people to want to buy from you. People work for people that they like and that they trust and, and in cultures that they, they feel comfortable in. So, so you can't hide uh, and, 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 and expect that to happen. And, and especially in a, a privately held family named business, uh, you know, you realize you are the figurehead of that company and the, and, and the, the spokesperson for that company. And, and uh, I, I, I find it really interesting in some ways that if we post something on the Ross video, you know, uh, Twitter feed or LinkedIn feed or something like that, it, and then I, I talk about it in my way, uh, which is the same information, but from a personal point of view, mm -hmm. I get 10 times the number of hits and responses than the whole corporation does. In some ways you think that's wrong. I have a team of people creating all this and it's just <laughs> yeah, me yeah. typing something for a few minutes and, and <laughs> it just seems too Your easy. Your poor communications team, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, but it's, um, I mean, people want to see the personal viewpoint. They want to know as well, you know, what the company really thinks and not just be marketed at. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think all those things make the company more successful and, and, and customers like the company and things like that. On the other hand, being personable is not a requirement for being successful. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm actually a fan of what Steve Jobs did, and I think Apple's a really amazing company, but I don't think anybody would ever say he was a nice person. <laughs> he was famously, you know, don't get in an elevator with him. He might fire you on the spot kind of a person. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, they did very, very well. So the, the trick is that the culture of the company needs to align with the culture of the person on top. And, and otherwise you get this, these weird things happening. I mean, if, if you've got a, a nice cult, culture and you put a mean person on top who's t tough or whatever else or whatever the personality attribute is, it's not going to work. You're going you're gonna to get people not getting mixed messages. Like our, 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 our mission statements and our culture stuff that's on the wall isn't matching what's coming from the C-suite. Uh, and, and so you get dysfunction and, and, and people fighting with each other. And, and customers can see this as well. On the other, but on the other hand, if if you have somebody who has a certain personality type, you know whether it's in Amazon or, or you name it, uh, 
as long as it's it, it's consistent through the company, it can work. Uh, the thing is, if, if you're a CEO working in a company that doesn't match your ethics and your culture, your personality, you're going to be really stressed out and you're not going to enjoy it and you're going to see a lot of fighting. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's, you know, the rotating door CEO companies, I, I, I wonder what that must be like because the culture from the top is just shifting all the time and, and it must cause, cause a lot, a lot of inefficiencies. And yeah. uh, so I guess that's one of the reasons as well that uh, I've got a company that's known for being approachable and nice because it, it's where I want to go to work every day. I enjoy working mm-hmm. in that that atmosphere. Yeah, and I think to relate that to science fair projects, for example, uh, which most of our listeners, I guess, are, are focusing on, the, the power of storytelling cannot be undersold. And so having your personality and expressing why this project, you know, uh, not your, you're not running a company yet, but why is this project so important to you? Like, why should people care about it? Why should people listen to you? Why should people want you to be winning that award, for example? Um, you you have to line it up with your personality. You know, if you're a hard, if you're a hard math, you know, calculations, formula-based person, then stick to that sort of person. Like, you know, really embrace that and say, like, these are the facts. This is why it's important. If you're a personal person, then, like, embrace the storytelling aspect. Like, tell, tell us why it's important to you. Why should we care about it? Absolutely. And, and, and the enthusiasm really needs to come through. I mean, if, mm-hmm. if, if, you know, it's a really good project, but the person, um, you, you feel like a teacher or a parent forced them to do this work. And they're like, yeah, then I did this calculation and then I ran the experiment again and this is what I found and this is the thing and the hypothesis therefore matches the conclusion. You know, as a judge, it's like, sorry, I, I fell asleep for a second. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I remember um, uh, there's one project at the science, Candlewood Science Fair where, where there, there's these two, two girls and they called themselves the Jello girls and they did a project on Jello. And they were so enthusiastic about it. And, and, uh, and it, it's, it was like, that's cool. All of a sudden, this whole project became fun because you could tell it was theirs and they're passionate about it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and speaking of passion, then let's let's just take a bit of a, a side step for a second and and talk about the, how much you love competing in triathlons and you know playing hockey badly, as your bio says on your website. <laughs> how important is it to to expand? I guess your your hobbies. Like, where does where, how do you fit? How do you fit that into your busy life when you have five hour CEO meetings, for example, and you're running a, a, you know, a business that hasn't stopped growing for the last 27 years? Where does it fit in? How is that important to you? And why should, why should students not put aside their hobbies and just to focus on science? Like why should they embrace the, the whole holistic approach to life? Well, it's, you know, as, as you know, I, I guess I am a, a, a marathon runner. And, and one of the things you, uh, you learn when running a marathon is it's not a sprint. Mm-hmm. You you learn if you go too fast at the start of that race, you're going to burn out by the end, and you're going to be walking across the finish line if you even make it. But if you if you try to have a steady steady pace and figure out what that steady pace is for you, then you could have the best time of your entire life. And and you know running a company like what I do, uh, or from that point of view, even spending a year on a science fair project, you know, like I used to is all about balance in some ways. It's all about keeping the pace and doing something that's manageable. Uh, and, you know, in my case, it's, you know, it's, you know, trying to balance personal health and fitness, which is really important uh, with, uh, with family, with uh, the, you know, putting the right, right amount of time into business and then, uh, you know, friends and fun. And when one of those things gets out of balance, nothing works. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, working on a company and growing it is a lifetime in my case it's a lifelong thing and which means it's a marathon not a sprint yeah i think it's it's so important as well i mean i, I was always taught this you know as a video for example video editor for example you know you, you finish a video and then you're supposed to take a step away for a couple of days and then come back to it with fresh eyes i think it's the same with the science fair project it's the same with business decisions any sort of like big decision anytime you're creating anything it's always important to take a step away and you know let your mind think about something else so that your subconscious can work through the problem or you know work through your opinions in, in the background without you sort of being consciously aware and your biases obviously start to play more of an impact when you're trying to consciously think of something um that whole subconscious thing like that is that's so important to, to making it a good decision 
especially when it is an important one. I, I think I think there's another aspect to it as well, which is uh, when you're working on a science for a project, it's usually either you or you and one other person, and mm -hmm. and so. There's not much you can do. The best you can do is try to make it fair between you and the other person or fair to yourself for how much time you want to put into the project. Um, when you start running a, a company, the, it's a different game. Uh, and you end up, you know, well, now we've got almost a thousand people in, in, in Ross Video. And I learned something. You have to transition. I, I, I learned that it's you're used to you know, working on projects. It's really on your back. And it's everything that you can do. When you start running, uh, say, an R and D group or a team of, of people, it stops being you, and it starts to be the team. Mm -hmm. And so, so you start realizing that no matter how hard you work as the leader of that team, you will never only make much of a difference unless you you empower that team and make them better at what they're doing. And uh, and then as the company started to grow, I started to realize that I was the impediment. You know, the team's gotten too big. I can't keep up with all, everything the team needs. So I had to give things away. You know, I'm, I can't do demos anymore. I need, I need a, a project manager over here and a tech writer over here. And, and I give, give, gave things away. And as the company grew 20% per year, uh, I realized I had to give 20% up every single year. And I did that for a couple of decades, which is a really weird thing to say. I'm going to give up one day a week of what I'm doing. Uh, and and uh, in one year, I got really smart. I said, why don't I give away two days a week this year? And all of a sudden, I realized that my calendar cleared out and I'm able to do more things like run triathlons and, uh, and, and have more hobbies and have more fun. And I suddenly went, why didn't I do that years ago? <laughs> and that's one of, the, one of the secrets to success is actually realizing things like that. Yeah, being able to, as you say at the start, it's a trust ball. And, and having yeah. that trust of someone is so hard when for so long it, it had just been you it's, it's your project it's, it's your little baby how do you just like let them grow up and just like let release them to the world and you know let other people help them along their way um and again like you are helping me so much right now because this is segueing perfectly to the next question which is and i'm only going to ask you this next question because of your reaction on social media and how much it still surprises you to hear but it's that quote it's so refreshing to meet a CEO that's enthusiastic about their <laughs> business. And obviously, passion is intrinsic to a truly great science fair project. But for some reason, we seem to lose that passion over time. But, but you haven't seemed to have lost that passion over time. So, so how, do we, how do you keep your passion and enthusiasm for yourself in your work? And how do we keep it within our students and future scientists? <sighs> it, it's, uh, I think it comes down to people. Mm -hmm. Again, um, the, I mean, there's so much, only so much you can stay passionate about completely within yourself. It, it's, it's all about, uh, you know, staying passionate about, uh, about the technology, uh, and seeing customers get excited about in my case, or judges getting excited about it, or teachers or family members or your partner, uh, in, in, in what you're doing in these things. And, and that's that, I think that's, it's kind of the way to just keep it interesting is, uh, is to share all that with people yeah i think you know that old adage you are the sum of the seven people you surround yourself with the most i think it's so important to find yourself that group it doesn't have to be you know physically close to you in terms of like actually at your school or anything but even if it's just people you meet at science fair for example you know, like take that opportunity to network with people that you know already have a passion for the things that you do and surround yourself with those sort of people because you know those days that you are feeling a bit down or you know, perhaps your business didn't have the success you wanted it to, or perhaps you didn't quite win the medal you wanted to it at the science fair, uh, regionals or Canada wide, for example, knowing that someone else or a couple of other people are going to be there to lift you back up and say like, Hey, remember how fun it was though, when you, you know, recreated the game and made it even faster or like rewrote your own rules. Um, you know, you, it's okay to ask for help and, and to have that support, support network around you. Yeah. I think it's important. Uh, and don't don't go it alone don't yeah that's a great message don't go it alone um so speaking of students then you're a popular advocate for the importance of students to the future of ross video uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what, what ross video is doing for students and why you see them as so cr crucial to your future success oh sure uh well one of the things we uh we support uh, science fairs <laughs> absolutely yeah <laughs> thank you very much by the way yeah 
Yeah, and and uh, robotics clubs as well. Am I allowed to say that? Uh, I mean, this is kind of a uh, no. This is youth sciences, so so you probably support robotics. They're not a competitor of you uh, for the attention. No, absolutely of not. No, <laughs> we support <laughs> any and all STEM in in school. Excellent. So I I think you know you know starting young. I think that's important uh, to 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 keep that going. Um, I mean, technology is so core to everything that's happening in our society and, and going forward. Uh, we, we have to have that deep knowledge uh, in the country. Uh, you know, we yeah, you have a good have a better reason for not sending, you know, all those jobs, all those technical jobs out of the country because you can't hire people in the country. But then there's people in the country that can't find a job. You know, please, if you go into STEM, you know, you're going to have your pick of jobs and and be very well paid for it. So I think that's fantastic. Um, the other side of it is uh, uh, co-op students. I mean, university students and some high school students as well. We, we have about 30 every four month work term uh, coming into Ross Video. And that's a, that's a lot of kids. <laughs> that's a lot when you've only got a thousand employees, yeah. Yes. And, uh, and I think it's fantastic. They, they, kids punch above their weights. I, I, it, they're, they're just so into it, so smart. They put so, so much creativity into it. Uh, I, it, I actually comment. I would say we're behind on this project. We need to hire, you know, another person or whatever else. And, and, and they'll say, well, no, no, no. It takes six months to a year for a person to come up to speed. You know, and I went really. Oh, that's interesting because you get a co-op student in here, and they leave after four months, and they've been productive. So why is it that students are way more productive and able to come up to speed than full-time staff? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm a big fan of students. Um, the other side of it is, uh, you know, the students then get full-time jobs. We love to offer them, and 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 we, we it's a great for us to develop a relationship before they graduate. And those students often go into two can go on two different paths. One could be a management path, and one would be a technical path. And if you hire people that have only been doing technical work for say four or five years, what they've done is they've self-selected out of ever being managers. And then you wonder why nobody in your team ever wants to become a manager. It's like, cause you hired for that. So when you hire students, they often want to do the technical thing for a few years, but the ones that want to become management, then you get, you can have them find that opportunity. And, and so from a company point of view, having this relationship with all these students at all these different levels, all the way from, hey, you spoke at my science fair. I mean, there's a true story in some ways. You spoke at my science fair, and now I'm in university and I'm doing STEM and I got a job at your company and now I'm working full time. It, the whole thing actually works out. It's a really neat path. And that person may well become a manager someday because they, 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 they want to combine management and technology at the same time and they don't have to leave your company. Mm -hmm. So there's, I mean, there's an, that's just the short answer of what we can do with students. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree with all of that. Uh, and, you know, it, it always goes back to what I said right at the very start when when you were, you know, doing a third side set project. You didn't know that you weren't supposed to be doing that sort of stuff. You had, you were just doing it because you were passionate about it. You thought it was a cool idea. Um, and you hadn't, you know, become jaded like adults tend to be sometimes that like you, you, you build you build your own boxes, you build yourself into your, your mm. own walls where you're like, oh, well, I just can't do that. But when you actually press them on the issue, it's like, well, why can't you do that? And mm. they don't really have a good answer for you. And I think that's when students are such a great, um, I don't know, like expectation breaker, I guess, almost, where you can just like throw anything at them and see what they come back with. And usually it's something much more creative and something much more productive than you would have expected had a whole team spent, you know, weeks and weeks working on it. I, th I think there's another thing, another aspect to this as well, is that I, I suddenly thought about, you know, it's a it's a non act a non random act of kindness. It's paying it forward. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I looked at my career and I suddenly went, you know, the science fair and all the things that I did back then, somebody paid for that. Some company sponsored that. Some people, you know, mentored me and uh, and people around me. Uh, and you know, when I look at what Ross Video became. Yeah, as a result of all that that kindness, it's like you know, it's nice to be able to give that back into society. That and, and maybe we'll, I won't get any benefit out of it, but uh, other than we have a better society. But mm -hmm. it's really neat to be able to 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 do that for the next generation. Yeah, and I think it doesn't have to be a zero sum game, right? Like, you know, your your sponsorship of the science fair 
the, the, the Ottawa Regional Science Fair, for example, even if none of those students directly come work for Ross Video, I think just having them out in the wider society, you know, innovating, uh, improving just society in general, that also elevates the opportunities for Ross Video as well. So it's not like, you know, if they don't come work for you directly, then you lose something. Like you haven't made money from your investment, for example. You know, that's where the financial side of things tick into it. Where is the direct result of my investment? It's just more about, and I, I think this also ties so nicely into why you, you know, have donated to the Australian bushfire relief, you know, why you only acquire businesses less than 10% of the size of Ross Video so that you can focus on keeping the thought leadership within the company or, you know, why you're focusing on developing products with smaller carbon footprints and you're, you know, you've got that sustainable approach to your business as well. It's all about just improving society, which might not have a direct, easily traceable, you know, contribution to your bottom line, but it still improves everyone it improves you know the lives of your employees it improves you know your product offerings it improves the services you're able to offer as part of ross video to your customers so it's still a win-win in the end and and you know the people that work for ross video they see that as well and they they want to be proud of the company that they work at they want to know that the fact that they're working at that company that 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 leads to these things happening uh so they feel a little less powerless or and that, that they're part of the solutions that happen. And uh, it, it's, you know, when you get to a, the size that Ross Video is, uh, it's, you start thinking about the bigger questions about, you know, what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think empowered employees as well are more productive, just in general. If you wanted a direct link, you know, you make someone feel good, you, you give them a reason for coming to work every day and you make it feel like the work they're doing actually contributes something to the well-being of both the company themselves and, you know, the, the local communities. Of course, it's going to make them work harder. They're happy to be there. They want to be there. So, yes. So, how do we then bring that to to you? And I guess your sponsorship of the Ottawa Regional Science Fair is a good start. And it's clear, obviously, you see science fair as being of particular importance, not only for youth but just society in general. But what is it you wish, I guess, to see from that support? Like, what are you, what are you hoping that that comes from supporting youth in STEM robotics clubs? empowering your local communities, keeping manufacturing in Canada? Well, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not just Ross Video, it's society as well. Uh, I, I think heh, it's interesting. Uh, this will date the, uh, perhaps date your podcast when we recorded it. But I mean, uh, what was it? Yesterday was International Women's Day. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, one of the things we can do to help tech STEM uh, is there's we can double, we don't have to double the population of Canada to double the number of people going into STEM. We just have to get girls and women to go into STEM more than they have in the past. And that will almost double it. Uh, and because it's, I, I know when I went to, uh, to school, uh, I had a class of 80 people in my computer engineering course and there was two women. Uh, and uh, and I, I've talked to people today and it's, in some ways it's not much better. Uh, so, you know, you go to a toy store and you see a whole wall of pink and dolls and things like that, you know, I don't care, I don't have anything against the, com the color pink, but can we not have uh, pink robots then and, and pink science, science kits and pink mm -hmm. hammers and <laughs> you, know, you name it. Uh, there's something still wrong with our society where we're, we're assigning gender roles uh, and uh, to, uh, to kids uh, and I don't see any physical lifting, physical strength requirements for writing software for a computer. It's, it's, it makes no sense that, that we don't have more than 50% of, of engineering you know, being done by women. And, uh, and certainly if I, if I have a wish for, uh, for our society being able to do a lot more, it's, it's how, how do we as a society really encourage more women to go into this field because that's that's the big obvious thing that's missing mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's be nice like why, why why is equality not a thing yet yeah i know what you mean it is tough um and so to, to wrap up my questions then for you what what do you consider a life worth living like what what is it that you hope when you when you look back on your whole career at ross video the influence you've had on on youth and stem um, you know, supporting supporting students going through university and high school. Um, what is it you think you'll be most proud of? Like, what what will you be be happy to share? You know, to your grandchildren, for example, to say that like, this is this is it. This is how I've how I've lived. That's a good one. 
Um, originally, it was the fact that I had three science fair medals. Um, I mean, but, uh, and the podcast right there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's... Uh, it's, it's my, you know, I can't make the whole world a better place. I mean, there's a lot of bad things going on around the world, but I can make the people that are, you know, around me uh, make their lives a better, better place. And, and, you know, using technology, I've been able to improve the prosperity of the people around me. Uh, I, I mean, uh, last year we, we set a minimum in our factory, which has lower paid roles. I, I set a minimum wage of uh, $20 an hour. You know, that's well above the $14 an hour minimum. I wanted to make sure there was a living wage. I'm proud of the fact that, you know, I was able to do that. And it actually raised the standard of living of 100 families in my hometown and in the surrounding region. That's pretty cool. And and we I like to think that they work in a company where they, they, they make friends, people have their backs, uh, and they're proud to work there. And they could be working in a place that's miserable. But I was able to give, hopefully, a thousand people in counting um, a good and meaningful job where, where they, they get excited about going into work every day and, and like their coworkers. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a bad start. No, not at all. That's a great start. Yeah, what a great, what a great way to finish the podcast. Well, David, this conversation has been absolutely amazing, as I knew it would be. Um, I've been excited for this chat for weeks now, and the more I get to understand your mindset and the wonderful work you do, with Ross Video, the more impressed I just become with your success. As a member of the Science Fair community, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the support you give through sponsoring the Ottawa Regional Science Fair and for your commitment to hiring co-op students and supporting the further education of STEM within our communities. As a hopefully future Canadian, I want to thank you for being a shining example of, a, of the Canadian spirit and for the incredible way you treat your staff, your customers and local communities. And as an Australian, I want to thank you for your wonderful support you donated to the Bushfire Appeal last year and for all the other charitable work and love you share around the world. Um, and finally, thank you so much for being proactive in the way you're leading the way towards sustainable business practices and positive corporate citizenship. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of things. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate having the chance to be on this show. It's, uh, it's, it's been quite an experience, but I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. And for everyone listening, we'll have an am- another amazing guest for you uh, on the next episode of the White House podcast. But thank you so very much, David, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us in this episode of Why to How, a podcast where we explore adventures in STEM. If you liked this podcast, consider leaving us a like on our social media. It's just ysc.sjc on Facebook and Instagram, ysc underscore sjc on Twitter. Leave us a comment with your favourite part of the interview and let us know your own thoughts on the topics we discussed. Please do share a link to the podcast or YouTube video with friends who you think would love to follow along. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review as it really does help us reach more people. We'll have another amazing guest for you on the next episode, so stay tuned for more. Until then, have a wonderful day and stay curious. <laughs>